call for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold a swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, would famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? On your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high uprearied and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. For it is your thoughts that now must deck our king. Carry them here and there, jumping our times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. May we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt on your imaginary forces work. In these lines, Shakespeare set forth the limitations of the theatre for which he wrote his plays in Elizabethan London. In Shakespeare's time, London was a flourishing city that extended beyond its medieval walls westward toward Westminster and northward to the Finsbury Fields. In the Finsbury district at varying dates were located James Burbage's original theatre and the Curtain Theatre. Shakespeare performed as an actor in both of these public playhouses. The Tower of London stood at the flank of the city wall on the Thames River embankment, slightly to the east of London Bridge. Playgoers crossed the Thames River by boat or afoot by way of London Bridge to the amusement area in Suffolk. Here were located the Swan Theatre, the Hope, the Rose which served as a bear pit as well as a theatre, and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. In Suffolk, the playhouses were free from the interference of the Puritan-minded Lord Mayor of London who banned public theatres and bear pits within the city proper. In review, the Tower of London appears to the right of the screen at the edge of the north bank of the Thames River. Crossing the Thames is the ancient London Bridge on which houses and shops were erected. The Globe Theatre was patterned after James Burbage's theatre and was, in fact, built with timbers salvaged from the theatre which had to be torn down when Burbage's lease on the land in Finsbury Fields expired. Under the thatched roof of the globe, there were three tiered galleries provided with benches, where the gentry and wealthier commoners sat with their womenfolk upon payment of an additional fee. Playgoers obtained refreshments from the orange girl, who circulated with her basket, or from the vendor of cider. For a penny, commoners bought standing room in the pit, which was the open, uncovered area in the center of the playhouse. A few London gallants sat on stools placed at the edges of the stage. The appearance of the prompter on the apron stage with his manuscript signaled the approach of curtain time. The projecting stage encouraged a lively interplay between the actors and the audience. Much of our knowledge of the Elizabethan theatre is derived from this sketch of the Swan Playhouse, drawn by Johann de Witt, a Dutch visitor to England in 1596. De Witt's sketch shows the stage of the Swan with a canopy supported by pillars. There is no evidence, however, to prove that all Elizabethan theatres were constructed in this way, or that the stage of the Globe had such a covering. In Shakespeare's time, 
The stage was a raised projecting platform with a large trapdoor in the center. There could have been smaller trapdoors at each corner. Doors on either side led to the actor's dressing or tiring room backstage. Above the stage was a balcony, and the alcove beneath it provided an inner stage, which could be curtained off if necessary. These features may all be observed in this film presentation. Curtain time at the Globe meant feverish activity backstage for the Lord Chamberlain's company of players. In Elizabethan England, women did not appear on the stage. Boy apprentice actors played the women's parts. Many of the boy actors were excellent in the feminine roles, though this convention was a challenge to the dramatist. Shakespeare overcame the seeming handicap by the situations he devised for his female characters and the skill of his writing. Shakespeare's audiences enjoyed pageantry, and this interest was satisfied by processions on the stage and by the actors' colorful costumes. Doublets and gowns were made of silks and velvets in bright gay colors, trimmed with jewels and costly gold and silver lace. Page boys announced the settings with placards. Note the trapdoor center stage and the richly curtained alcove or inner stage. This was the theater of William Shakespeare, its location, its audience, its players, its conventions, and its construction. As you read Shakespeare's plays, like his audiences at the Globe Theater, let your imaginary forces work.